It was a silent night in Chernobyl, but something went terribly wrong. A nuclear reactor exploded and the sky caught fire. What began in one small town destroyed everything, from Pripyat to the heart of the Soviet Empire forever. This is the story of Chernobyl, the greatest disaster in history. I am Valery Legasov. I was one of the scientists sent to Chernobyl plant after the explosion took place. I have decided to record my confession because the world needs to hear the truth. What happened at Chernobyl was a consequence of our government complete failure. The Soviet government buried the facts, hiding the real scale of the disaster from its own people. I had a choice to stay silent or die. But I cannot stay quiet any longer. The people of the Soviet Union deserve the truth, and they will have it. On the night of April 26, 1986, just after midnight, a phone call woke me from sleep. It was chairman of the Bureau of Fuel Energetic Complex, Boris Sherbina. His voice was tense as he said, The reactor number four at Chernobyl has exploded. At first, they assured me the core was still intact and the graphite hadn't caught fire. But within hours, troubling reports began to arrive from faraway cities. Strange glowing lights in the sky and radiation detected hundreds of miles away. We had a meeting with high-level officials soon after. I, along with the Boris Shabina, was sent to Chernobyl to understand the true scale of the disaster, to uncover the truth. But back then, most people believed it was nothing serious, just a small accident that would be contained quickly. A few hours later, I boarded a military flight to Kiev, Ukraine, with Boris Sherbina, the man now leading the Soviet crisis response. On the way, we spoke briefly about the accident at Three Mile Island in 1979. That was serious, but this felt different. From Kiev, the Chernobyl station was about 140 kilometers away. People often assume the plant was located in the city of Chernobyl, but it wasn't. The station stood 18 kilometers away, much closer to a newer city called Pripyat. That's where most of the plant's workers lived, engineers, technicians, their families. Nearly 50,000 people, all packed into what was meant to be a model Soviet city. As we drove from the city of Chernobyl toward Pripyat, I looked out the window, and I'll never forget what I saw. The sky wasn't right. It was mulberry, purple, like something had bled into the clouds. And in that moment, I knew something was terribly wrong. When we arrived at the plant, the truth was already in the air. The officials on the ground knew what had happened, but fear of Moscow, fear of losing their positions, fear of speaking the truth, clouded their judgment. We ordered the immediate shutdown of reactors 1, 2 and 3. If the others failed, it would mean catastrophe beyond imagination. Soon after, we flew over reactor 4 by helicopter, and I saw it with my own eyes. It wasn't a fire, it wasn't a leak. The reactor had exploded, completely, like a nuclear bomb had gone off. The roof was gone, the core was exposed, burning, open to the sky. That wasn't supposed to be possible. Then I heard what the firefighters had done. They ran straight into the flames, without protection, without knowing what radiation could do. They climbed onto the roof, sprayed water directly into the blaze, held hoses with their bare hands. Some collapsed within minutes, skin burned from the inside but they held their ground. They were the first to respond, the first to die. What they did was nothing short of heroic, and still the core was burning. When the reactor exploded, uranium fuel rods shattered and scattered radioactive debris across the site. Among them were the graphite blocks, the very ones we used inside the reactor to slow down neutrons and control the chain reaction. Graphite itself isn't radioactive, but the explosion changed that. The graphite became coated with radioactive fission products, iodine, cesium, strontium, the deadly byproducts of nuclear fuel. Then the fire started. The heat was unimaginable, over 2000 degrees. 
and graphite, under those conditions, burns like coal. As it burned, it carried those radioactive particles up into the sky. That's what made the smoke so dangerous. Not the graphite alone, but what was stuck to it. The reactor didn't just explode. It created a radioactive volcano, one that kept spewing poison for days. And the core? It was still reacting. Neutrons kept bouncing, splitting atoms, releasing more heat and more death. We had two goals, stop the reaction and cool the core. The scientists came up with two plans. First, boron carbide to absorb the neutrons, then lead to smother the heat. Helicopters flew directly over the reactor and dropped 40 tons of boron, followed by 2,400 tons of lead. Later, we dropped dolomite a compound that would smother the flames and release carbon dioxide to help suffocate the fire. The core temperature was successfully restored and the reaction was coming under control. But there was still a problem. It was melting down. The explosion wasn't just a disaster in Chernobyl. It became a nightmare the world couldn't ignore. Just days after the fire began, the first reports came from far beyond our borders. Radioactive clouds drifted silently across Europe. Swedish scientists were the first to speak up. They detected radiation at their nuclear plants, alarming levels, impossible to explain without an accident. And then came the fallout in Germany. Nuclear rain, they called it. Radioactive particles falling from the sky, contaminating land and water. Across the ocean, the Americans released satellite images came to proof, undeniable proof, of a massive explosion at our plant. But back here, in the shadow of the reactor, the people closest to the disaster were kept in the dark. Our government sealed off the truth, hiding the scale of the catastrophe beneath a veil of silence and lies. We were told it was under control, that the danger was minimal, that there was no cause for panic. The truth? They cared more about the image of strength than the lives burning in the radioactive firestorm. Families inhaled poison, children played in contaminated dust, workers risked death without proper protection, all because the machinery of secrecy refused to admit the truth. This disaster wasn't just about a reactor failing, it was about the failures of a system built on silence, denial and corruption. And while the world watched from afar, the people of Chernobyl were left to suffer alone in the radioactive shadow. I watched as the city of Pripyat, once full of life, was emptied in a matter of hours. It started 36 hours after the explosion. Too late, radiation had already seeped into their lungs, their clothes, their homes. But finally, the buses came, hundreds of them. They told people it was temporary. Just a precaution. Pack light, you'll be back in a few days. But no one ever came back. Mothers carried children. The elderly carried memories, photo albums, a pillow, a jacket, that's all. They were taken to unfamiliar towns, Kiev, Poltava, far from the reactor. They had no idea how much they had already lost. Then came the villages, one after another, 2,500 square kilometers cleared. If they resisted, soldiers came. Some begged to stay, others simply vanished, but the pets, the animals, they were left behind. And we, we ordered them killed. Dogs waited on porches, cats meowed at closed doors. And our soldiers, they followed orders. It was quiet, efficient. This wasn't just evacuation, it was the erasure of a way of life. An invisible enemy had poisoned the earth, and the system that allowed it was just as toxic. Soon, another terrifying danger revealed itself. The molten remains of the reactor core had begun to burn through the concrete under the plant. If it continued to melt downward, it would eventually reach the groundwater, a vast aquifer that ran under the plant and into the Dnieper River. If the radioactive core reached that water, it would cause a steam explosion far greater than the first. It would poison the river system, reach the Black Sea, 
and contaminate water supplies across half of Europe. To prevent this, we had to act, and act fast. Our only option was to build a subterranean heat exchanger beneath the reactor, a structure to freeze the ground to create a kind of ice shield that would keep the core from seeping further. But we couldn't build it with machines. We needed to dig fast. That's when they came, the miners. They arrived by the hundreds, summoned from the coal mines of Donetsk and Tula. These were men who were used to working in darkness, in heat, under pressure. But nothing could have prepared them for what we asked them to do. They worked around the clock, in shifts, digging a tunnel directly beneath the destroyed reactor. The heat was so intense, radiation so high, that their protective suits became unbearable. They didn't ask questions, they didn't protest, they simply did the job. Some of those men died within months. Others carried the damage in their bones for the rest of their lives. But what they did down there, in the dark, in silence, changed everything. The second explosion never came. The rivers continued to flow. They never received medals, no parades, no monuments. Their names were buried, just like the tunnel they dug. But I remember them, and the world should too. When the court hearings began in 1987, I knew the world needed to hear the truth. Even if it was uncomfortable for those in power, the explosion on April 26, 1986, was not just an accident or something that had to happen. It was caused by a dangerous mix of human mistakes and a flawed reactor design. At its heart, a nuclear reactor produces heat through a controlled chain reaction. Inside the reactor, uranium atoms split apart in a process called fission. When these atoms split, they release heat and neutrons, which cause more atoms to split, keeping the reaction going. The heat boils water, creating steam. This steam turns turbines, which generate the electricity that powers cities and factories. Our plant used an RBMK reactor, a Soviet design that was powerful and cheap, but also had hidden dangers that Western reactors didn't. This reactor used graphite blocks to slow down neutrons and water to cool the core. That night, we were running a safety test. It was designed to check if the cooling water pumps could keep running during a power outage. If those pumps stopped, the reactor would overheat. The test simulated a sudden power loss to see if the backup systems could keep the pumps running until power was restored. But to run the test, the reactor's power had to be lowered to an unstable and dangerous level. This made controlling the reactor very difficult. One man, Anatoly Dyatlov, the deputy chief engineer, pushed the operators to continue the test despite clear warning signs. When the reactor's power dropped too low, they tried to raise it again. But the reactor's behavior became unpredictable. The power surged uncontrollably. During the test, when the emergency shut down, it called scram, but was triggered, a critical design flaw made things worse. The control rods, which are supposed to slow the reaction, had graphite tips. When inserted, these tips displaced the water in the lower part of the reactor, briefly increasing the reaction instead of slowing it. This caused a sudden spike in power. At 1.23 a.m., the surge blew apart the reactor core. The vessel ruptured and a deadly cloud of radiation was released. This was not just human error, it was a systemic failure, a flawed reactor design, poor training, mismanagement, and a culture that punished those who dared to question. At the hearings in 1987, I laid out these facts clearly. It was a truth that shook the Soviet nuclear establishment, but it was the only way to stop something like this from ever happening again. In the Soviet Union, truth was often the first casualty. Behind the scenes, a vast machinery of corruption and secrecy worked tirelessly to hide the disaster's full scale. When I tried to speak openly about what really happened, I was quickly pushed aside. My warnings were ignored, my voice silenced. I was followed, threatened, and made to understand that some truths were too dangerous to tell. Speaking out wasn't just a risk, it was a threat to my life. The government chose silence and lies over honesty. They preferred to protect their image rather than protect the people, the very people who suffered in the radioactive shadow. After years of fighting alone, I came to a dark place. The weight of knowing the truth and watching it be buried 
became unbearable. That is why I decided to end my life, not out of despair alone, but because I wanted the world to remember, to never forget what happened and the cost of silence. If you want to watch more such fun and informative videos, smash that subscribe button.